My name's Colin Compton. Um, as Michael says, my background is preservation. Uh, Cleveland Heights asked us specifically to do a presentation on landscapes, which I was excited about because it was something previously that I didn't know a terrible amount about. The uh, world of landscape and landscape design is something within preservation that we touch on, but we don't often get too in-depth with. So this was very much a research-based presentation uh, for me. So tonight is landscaping by style. To put this together, I came up with a couple goals for the presentation. Firstly, I wanted to obviously establish a timeline for landscape history in America. I wanted to be preservation related and associate that with a timeline of architectural periods as well. And then to keep it local, I wanted to apply the above to what we see locally and how we can apply that locally, especially in the Heights area. So if we're talking about a timeline, you start at the beginning. We'll start with the early colonial period, roughly a period of 1620 to 1820. For this period, a lot of landscape historians and historians in general admit that there are few primary records that exist. Landscape design um, was a lot of, um, there was a lot of conjecture to determine what were they using back then. So we know from, from these sources that there was a focus on utilitarianism. There was a focus on growing what we need to survive. Uh, there, therefore, there were a lot of fruit trees, vegetables, herbs, uh, fruits, etc. The colonials were, were producing and growing things that they needed to survive. With these landscapes, we see often that the landscape itself is surrounded by a fence or a hedge. Most often, it seems that it was a wooden fence. They were using what they had on hand. The fence, again, is utilitarian. Its purpose was to keep the livestock out. These are fruits and vegetables that we need to survive. Let's keep the livestock out. Oftentimes, they had a simple central path to the front door. And in this time period, it's rare to see foundation plantings around the home. This is um, a saltbox style house at the Western Reserve Historical Society's property at Hale Farm and Village down in Bath. That's where I did an internship for uh, a summer at. I really recommend you go down there to see how they've interpreted landscapes from the early Western Reserve days. Additionally, kitchen gardens were very prevalent and very common in this time. The kitchen gardens were placed near the house because these were items that the owners were using frequently. Larger beds that contained things like fruits and vegetables were placed a little bit further from the house because they were used less frequently. Early on, we see few uh, flower beds, but later on, as seeds and bulbs became more available, we see those were incorporated more so. Typical layouts, from what I read, it was uh, found that a lot of these early settlers were basing their layouts on the countries of their origins. Uh, so we see a very strict uh, European influence for these gardens. Highly geometric, square or rectangular beds we see. There was often a central axis running down the garden with smaller paths coming off of that. The, the paths themselves were often gravel near the coast. They could be cl crushed clam shells or even just compacted earth. Oftentimes, there was also a focal point in the garden, whether it was some type of arbor or even just a water well. Moving forward in time, uh, next we get to the early revival period. The, within the early revival period, architecturally, we see that designs looked to the past for inspiration. Predominant common styles we see are Greek Revival, which we see here. Again, this is a Hale Farm and Village property. We see Gothic Revival here. This is on the west side. And we see Italian Nate. This is a property that still exists on St. Clair. These were um, oftentimes smaller, more urban lots as populations moved north, more towards cities. So within the early revival period, we see certain landscape trends. Uh, this period saw the beginning of a shift from the geometric designs, which were seen as colonial and European, to more curvilinear and picturesque styles. Being that they were urban lots, they were less utilitarian. 
there still were kitchen gardens because these are still gardens that the homeowners were using, but they were often screened from view. We do also start to see decorative beds used on the property. It was common in these days for the decorative beds of flowers to be a bed devoted to one variety. So you would have one bed of one variety of plants, another bed of another variety. There wasn't much intermixing within one bed. Still in this period, we see few foundation plantings. And given the urban context and the urban lots, we still see fenced lots. Andrew Jackson Downing within this period was the leading landscape designer, and he is considered one of the most influential landscape designers in American history. He established the periodical The Horticulturalist, which provided writings on landscape design, plant types, etc. His desire and his aesthetic was to, to move away from a European-influenced landscape design and to more so Americanize the landscape. So what can be referred to, we could say, as the Downing-esque landscape has certain very distinct elements. Firstly, he favored open lawn space, wide, expansive open lawns. Again, getting away from the colonial, we're getting into curvilinear design. So he favored curvilinear paths circular or elliptical flower beds, decorative items like urns or vases. And he was a big proponent of a planned vista. The overall aesthetic that he preferred, which you can really see illustrated up here, was one in which the landscape seemed extremely natural, but in fact was highly planned. Still within the Downing S landscape, still within this early revival period, again, we do still see him employing kitchen gardens, but they were often hidden, as I mentioned, or screened. Trees were used as anchors. They anchored corners of buildings. They framed views. He, did, he was a, a, in favor of employing rustic elements like rustic seating. And as I mentioned, he was also um, someone who used fences and walls along property lines, especially on urban lots. So here we see various views of Euclid Avenue, and it, they do illustrate some of his principles. Open lawns, trees used to frame views, fenced lots, etc. And then moving forward in time, we come into the Victorian era, roughly, depending on who you ask, 1880 to 1910. So this was um, a vast departure from the previous. This favored the Victorian era and in landscape design and in other areas of design, favored exotic, exuberant, rare species. Uh, especially with landscape design, you were seen as being worldly if you were able to have a rare, bright, colorful plant in your garden. So bold and bright colors were really favored. We see a vast movement away from symmetry um, the Victorian landscape is much less uh, focused on symmetry and formality. Wrought iron became very popular in this time period as decorative elements and as fencing, and perimeter plantings did as well. Uh, this is our building on Prospect Avenue, Victorian era home, and this is to the west of us, our garden, which we designed when we uh, restored the building. We incorporated elements of the Victorian, like wrought iron perimeter plantings, vine work, to, to create a, a, a general feel of the Victorian era within the garden. Carpet bedding was so common that one critic within in the Ladies' Home Journal described it as pimples on nature's face. Carpet bedding was arranging colorful, bright plants in specific patterns to give the feel of almost an oriental rug or an oriental carpet. They became very fond of ornamental grasses. They were used very often. And so-called fountains of flowers. So we see these wrought iron elements used, decorative elements used to hold overflowing so-called fountains of flowers. Vines also became uh, very popular. Vines were incorporated to both shade porches or shade trellises and arbors, but also to create a pop of color with a flowering vine. So you'll see that these houses here, 
uh, they're not Victorian era houses, but the landscape itself was adapted to the Victorian era. And my coworkers asked, you, asked me as an aside to mention that it's not a good idea to plant vines on your home. So uh, if this is something you're interested in, uh, do your research because it can do some damage to the home, even though it is so gorgeous. This is an era where we finally start to see foundation plantings. The Victorian era, the homes started to get a little higher. Foundations were a little higher. So we start to see plants placed along the foundations. We also start to see hedges used to mark property lines as well. And then moving forward in time, we come to the eclectic era, roughly 1900 to 1940s. So this was a direct rejection of the previous period, a rejection of the Victorian. Within this period, they sought to uh, emulate earlier historical styles. This is the time period, the predominant period of significance for the Heights area. So this is really where I spent a lot of time. Elements of the eclectic landscape. Again, as a rejection of the Victorian, we moved from having rare exotic foreign species back to having native plants and local materials. The outdoor was seen at this point increasingly as an additional living space, even if it wasn't near the home. And we do see a certain level of return to utilitarianism with the incorporation of fruit trees and herbs into the plantings. This is the uh, Glidden estate that stood on the west side on uh, Lakewood's so-called Gold Coast. And you can see here that we're moving back to a formal design. We're seeing the incorporation of trellises, etc. cetera. Uh, this is also a time period where we start to see herbaceous borders. We're returning back to some symmetry. And again, as in the early revival period, we start to see trees used as anchors. They anchor corners, they frame views, etc. This is an excellent example of a home and a landscape from this period, the Tremaine Gallagher House, right around the corner on Fairmount Boulevard. Pergolas with vines were, were widely used. This is the Farber Morse House. It's on the west side on Lake Avenue in Lakewood. Just to the east here, which I couldn't get a good photo of because of the landscape, there's an extensive arbor system, which from historical uh, photos was in existence there. So they used arbors, they used pergolas to plant vines on. Again, we see planned vistas on larger lots. And this is really a period where decorative garden furniture and individual garden structures were highly used. And then this is my favorite non-local example. Uh, this is Anna Gilman Hill's walled garden at Grey Gardens in East Hampton. If any of you have seen the 70s documentary Grey Gardens, you, see, you, you know that little Edie references this. The, a big part within this period was to, to replicate a sense of age, since we're looking on the past for inspiration. So these are colorized images of the garden shortly after construction. You'll see that it's given a strong sense of age. It's meant to look like it's been there for ages. But these are, in fact, poured concrete walls. Uh, poured concrete walls that are punctured with doors. They're punctured with windows over here. There's an individual garden tool shed. There are arbors and trellises. And even here, there is a raised platform that looks out over the wall and looks out to the surrounding landscape towards the sea. During this period, it was also Increasingly common to see female landscape designers and landscape architects, especially of a certain social standing. It was seen as acceptable. This was an acceptable form of employment or interest for them to take on. So locally, within uh, the eclectic era, architecturally, what do we see? And what sort of general rules or general tendencies can we apply? Colonial revival we see a lot of in the area, whether it's a strict colonial revival, Dutch colonial, Georgian. We will, uh, for the sake of landscape elements, you can draw highly on the colonial era for this. So we're seeing formality, we're see, we can see symmetry, we can see balance. Because these buildings are often symmetrical, perfect symmetri perfectly symmetrical, they work well to have a central axis leading up and to have mirrored gardens on either side. And again, drawing back to the original colonial period, hedges, picket fences are very common and very appropriate. 
the Tudor style, this is much less formal. Landscape elements we see here, uh, like I mentioned, is much less formality, less symmetry, a greater sense of the picturesque. So trees, shrubs of varying sizes that are used to frame the building. And uh, evergreens are very common within this style. We, see, we do see some Italian Renaissance. Uh, this is another formal style, so we see formality, symmetry, balance once again. It's another style that lends itself to a central access to mirrored gardens. And this is a style that, in which hedges and evergreens are common to frame, to highlight the building, to create edges, etc. And then late within moving out of the sort of eclectic era is craftsmen. These are a much less altered terrain to see much more natural. This is a style which epitomizes integrating the exterior and the interior. So porches flow into sunrooms, flow into the living room. And within, within those porches and sunrooms, integrating things like planters, window boxes, hanging plants is very common. This is a style that both in the architecture and the landscape stressed a, uh, an element of the rustic and the handcrafted. And again, this is, as with the general era, emphasized uh, uh, an emphasis on the local, local plants, local materials. And then finally, I touched on a few within the modern era. We see a few modern era homes in the Heights, so I thought I would touch on these. Uh, firstly is the minimal traditional style. It was a transitional style between the more traditional and the more modern. So you see elements in, of both in this, in both design and in materials. Uh, these are very informal. Open lawns are very common because by this time caring for an open lawn was very easy. Oops. And then the ranch style, which we do see. Uh, these are extremely informal. They really use a lot of, in both the architecture, obviously, but in the landscape as well, long, low lines. There's very little, if any, symmetry. It's common to have, as you see with the top image, built-in planters, incorporated planters into the home. And due to the rise of the automobile uh, and due to the spread out nature of the home, large expansive parking areas and large expansive patio areas are very common with this. And then just as an aside, the, the most important thing is to create a space that you're going to love, create a space that you're going to enjoy. Don't feel too constricted by styles. See what you can draw on for influence, but don't feel like you have to you know, follow the book exactly. But if you do want to follow the book, these are three excellent books uh, that I used. I got these out of the, the Clevenet library system. If you're looking for specific plant types, this American home landscape will, do, will give you listings of by style, what's appropriate, what, what's by region appropriate. Uh, this is very historical based in terms of throughout the, the span of time, what was common in landscape, uh, as is this one. So if you're looking for further sources, these are, these are excellent for you. So that's the long and short of it. I thank you for your time. If anyone has any questions or comments, I'm more than happy to do what I can to answer. Sure. Um, uh, concerning the trends in landscape, mm -hmm. uh, I think that one of the most uh, influential is the English garden, uh, this sort of informal mm -hmm. uh, cottage sure. garden. And I, I think. Uh, And in terms of locally, if we think of house styles, and we think of the Tudor, we think of the Georgian, we think of these styles that adapt and can have that type of garden applied so well to them, you see those a lot locally. And I think they can both be informal and they can be highly formal. You know, you can have a Tudor that isn't symmetrical but still has a very formal front garden um, and vice versa. So absolutely, I agree. Our kinds of 
landscapes in favor of the lawns and corn plants and all that. We've destroyed habitat for our pollinators and <coughs> sure. worms and things that birds sure. and we're killing off our bird population and yeah. 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 So I'm feeling very guilty about the lawn. <laughs> a big open, open lawn? lawn. I feel yeah. like I should let the whole thing go back to nature. Um, we are going to do a bicycle tour later this summer uh, that will go to people growing vegetables in the front lawn. Uh, yeah, food not yeah. yard, and um, the other one's permaculture gardens and so on. So, um, and the zoning code for Cleveland Heights has changed, so you can do just about anything you want, I guess, now. Um, but it's it's interesting that suddenly I feel guilty about pulling weeds out of my yard, because I'm killing all those little microorganisms that are down there in the soil that are absorbing um, carbon dioxide. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I'm very conflicted. <laughs> yes. I have to say three things quickly. Um, first of all, you're showing books here that go into history, but I own a number of things right from the 20s and 30s, bank books and guns, magazines and garden books from the 20s and 30s. So they're not that hard to find. If you want to see exactly what they say, what to do, and what to plant and everything, they're not that hard to find in you know, used books, vintage books, stores, etc., eBay, etc. Google books. Um, read it free online. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you know, um, that you have a different perspective than if you're looking at a book on the history of landscape, it might take an 80 year mm -hmm. period of it if, if you have the actual thing. Number two, um, I noticed one big difference in landscape in the like, 60s and 70s, particularly 70s and other was when they went in for all these mulches and a lot of space between the plants. And then a little later came all in railroad ties, and then a little later came all these, um, what do you call them? They're, they're like breaks, and they're different shapes, you know. They sell them like at a Home Depot or garden stores. Um, can't think of the word now. There's a general word for those, like the ox, the ox, the octagons, or, mm -hmm. you know, bricks, or pavers, all yeah. different kinds of pavers, people you know, are using that. Okay, um, number three, um, do you remember the idea that railing, they have their, that CRS, is there any historical precedent for that wrought iron railing? The wrought iron, no. The, it was just a modern interpretation. The guy's name is Jim McKnight. He's a landscape designer. Um, the garden was done when we took the building over in the 80s. Um, so I know very much it's just, it's not meant to look like it's always been there. That was the intent, to draw upon materials, but to not to create a false sense of history that this has always been there. Um, so design-wise, do I know specifically? No. I agree. Mm -hmm. So this is our headquarters on Prospect Avenue, Cleveland Restoration Society. This is, this is the one you're talking about, right? Yeah, this is on Prospect <coughs> Avenue. Uh, this was the home of Sarah Benedict. She was a widow who built this house in the late 1800s. Um, it had a series of owners, then it was vacant for a while, then it was a bar for a while. Uh, it was donated to our organization by Maxine Goodman Levin. 
and we uh, took over the restoration of it. It was basically kind of bombed out on the inside and on the outside as well. Sometimes I drive on Prospect to see those old pictures. Is it like open to the public? If you take my card and you swing by and hit the buzzer at the back door, I'll give you a tour. <laughs> The, uh, the main part that was actually restored is the main floor. So that was uh, a restoration. Our offices are on the second floor, so there are still a lot of elements that are original, but it's office space. And there are two other tenants in the building. But the main floor is the one that was really restored to the period. Yes? No, we, we worked with the city because it was, um, the doors were open and there were people going in and out, it's vacant. Yeah. So we worked with the city to get that closed up and to make sure that people stopped going in and out, but uh, we don't own it, no. Yes? Does your organization have any say on any projects that are currently going under restoration in downtown? Uh, we advise on the, organ the part of the organization I work with is the Heritage Home Program, and we work with residential homeowners. Uh, a couple of my other coworkers are more, they do more so um, outreach to the general community, uh, preservation services. So we've, we've had a hand at the table in um, discussing a few of the projects, uh, but me personally, no. Uh, within the city and actually the county, we're all over, uh, really all over. It just depends on um, specific areas and how active their community is in restoration and preservation and how active their homeowners are. Would you be meaning um, if there are preservation issues in the region, do they get involved? Is that kind of what you Well, because I know of certain homes, say, um, where the, um, the gardens are, on the market. Mm -hmm. that are, there's a question, should we restore them? So I, I just wondered if, like, if your foundation has any bearing on that. Well, if they're, if they're residentially owned and the home, homeowner is interested in doing so, or the city is interested in, or even the council person of the ward is interested in you know, bringing us to the table to discuss it, absolutely, we do a lot of consulting work on the feasibility or design or, or whatnot of specific buildings. Um, you know, there are, like I said, there are areas that are a lot more active and the, the area around the, the cultural gardens, that sort of Wade Park area is very active in preservation. So, Cleveland has a relationship with Cleveland Heights. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, we're very active in Cleveland Heights. Consult with people from, if you want to do something like Thrifty, Mm -hmm. We consulted the Restoration Society when we wanted to replace the siding on our uh, 1904 home, and they gave us really two acceptable alternatives, just two, and, and we did choose one, but um, they were very helpful in that regard. Thank you. So I did bring plenty of, I have brochures over here for our organization, I have my own business card. Um, any questions, any comments, if you want a copy of the PowerPoint for any reason, you want to send me an email, um, feel free, I'm available at any point. And thank you for coming. Thanks.